Welcome to this special episode of Be Reasonable. This is a podcast from the Merseyside Skeptic Society, hosted by me, Michael Marshall. In each interview, I, a skeptic, talk to somebody that I disagree with, somebody who's got beliefs that are outside of the mainstream, and I try to find out what makes them tick. In the past, I've talked to people who believe that the world is flat, and people who believe that the world is hollow. I've talked to people who believe that 9-11 was an inside job, and that dinosaurs are still flying around in America to this day. I've talked to people who claim that they're psychic and that they can talk to the dead. And I've talked to people who believe they can cure cancer using alternative medicine or industrial bleach. I tried to look at all manner of different claims to try and understand what is it that draws people to beliefs that are so far outside of the mainstream. My aim is to kind of explore how these views are constructed and what evidence people have that they feel supports their case. I believe in approaching subjects with respect and an open mind. This is a conversation, it's not an argument. So my guests are going to say things that I completely disagree with, and I'm not going to pick up on every single thing that I think they're wrong about. My goal here isn't to correct them or to beat them in a debate, but rather to understand what is it that draws people to beliefs that run so contrary to the mainstream. So with all that said, I'd like to share with you now my interview with today's guest, Matt Letissier. Joining me today on Be Reasonable is former England international footballer and sports pundit, Matthew Letissier. Uh, Matt, welcome to Be Reasonable. Thanks very much. Good to be here. Um, So the nature of this show, I like to talk to people who have uh, ideas that are outside of the mainstream. So uh, as much as I'd love to spend an hour talking to you about your football career uh, and uh, and, uh, things in that kind of area, um, for the purpose of this show, I'd like to kind of focus on what really feels like a journey you've been on in maybe the last sort of three or four years. Um, something that kind of uh, area. So um, when it comes to your questioning of the conce- of the perceived uh, narrative around COVID and the vaccines and things like that, can you remember when you started to um, question what you were seeing and what it was that made you start to, I guess, diverge from what a lot of people would, th- would think was actually happening? Um, I think the first thing that I can remember um, was seeing some uh, videos come out of China of people just falling down in the street uh, and this being attributed to a respiratory virus. Um, uh, And I looked at those videos and and I thought, they don't look very genuine to me. Um, uh, And uh, I then saw um, a lot of stuff in the media, which was just pure, for me, fear-based propaganda. and I didn't think uh, I, I felt like early on something didn't didn't feel right to me. Um, it seemed like there was um, a narrative being pushed uh, for a respiratory virus, which they kind of knew very early on um, who it affected, uh, and they knew um, that it was not a high consequence infectious disease very early on. Um, They had a lot of data from the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, but that Mm. was uh, all data that they had very early on. And to me, uh, why they had all that data, uh, the reaction to, um, to this virus seemed to be completely over exaggerated. Um, and that was where I started on my journey uh, of uh, trying to work out why they're making such a big deal out of it when they knew that the fatality rate was somewhere in the region of the flu hmm. uh, and knew that the, the average age of the people that were dying from this was actually older than um, how old people would normally live. Um, and so those things alone... Uh, very early on were the things that drove me to think, yeah, something's not right here. And and what did you start to think was happening then? Because I think um, when I started to see uh, the the news coming out about COVID, I was you know unsure. I was I was scared because it was kind of something completely unknown. Um, but but when we started to see people dying, it sort of did really feel like something needs to be done here, kind of over and above the flu. Right. So what did you kind of surmise was happening you as a result of all that? 
you sound like when you say when we started to see people dying, you sound like that people don't die. People die every day. That's true. Um, and but uh, but you're right. You you were scared. You were scared, and it made your thinking slightly irrational. Is is how I perceive it from some, sure. somebody who wasn't who wasn't scared, um, uh, because I kind of looked at the at the evidence and looked at it. Uh, with a clear, rational mind, uh, without without the fear, um, and I think if you look at things without fear, you can you can come to a much more rational conclusion. Um, and I think that's kind of what happened to a lot of people that they were scared, uh, intentionally. In my in my opinion, uh, they were intentionally frightened to stop them from thinking rationally. Um, uh, and I didn't subscribe to that, so I didn't give in to the fear, and I and I was able to keep. Uh, what I perceived was a was a cool head, and to look at things rationally, um, and things didn't make sense to me. So, do you think fear can be a rational response from looking at the evidence? I'm thinking if there was a. So, I was trying to establish first of all, kind of what you what you felt about the the virus. I know I've talked to a lot of people who don't believe COVID was even real, that there even was a virus. It doesn't seem like you're in in that camp. Um, so, if there was a incredibly deadly virus circulating the globe at uh, at high pace that people didn't know a lot about is Incredi- would fit- again Sorry. again incredibly deadly virus it had the same fatality rate as the flu and they knew that early on everybody knew that early on they didn't speak about it but they knew and that's so we, we will come back to that but I, I was first of all sort of saying let's say that we uh set aside covid for a second and think of a hypothetical virus which was actually very deadly would fear not be a rational response to that as what i was trying to get at you were saying you 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 kept fear out of it but if there was something quite quite severe a lot of people were scared is fear irrational in that situation no fear doesn't have to be induced fear doesn't have to be induced by the media and your government mm. if there was a deadly virus going around uh you would know about it you would see people around you uh, and you would you wouldn't need the government to induce fear in you what you were seeing with your own eyes would be enough to scare you and you would stay inside and hide away from it and so so that's this it, is what i think it. no absolutely and obviously i'm i'm here to hear your opinion and i think that's kind of uh that's a useful thing but what i think is interesting is so i i do know people who were seeing people dying from this i know people who worked in hospitals i know people who had uh, family members who are otherwise relatively healthy who are no longer with us and they died because of COVID. And, and so they were seeing with their own eyes the effect. I didn't see that because a lot of the people around it, me aren't you know, uh, older and uh, I don't see my family a great deal. So I wouldn't have seen that. So it, it just makes me think, you know, um, the people who are seeing it, um, they would have a very different reaction and a different experience of the pandemic to what I had because of what they were, what they were seeing in the hospital wards where they were working, for example. Um, well, uh, I think there's probably a few things to unpack uh, in all of that. Um, firstly, the classification of what was a COVID death. Uh, secondly, you'd have to look at uh, the way that people were being treated. Um, uh, I think a lot of people don't realise what was happening in, in care homes with the do not resuscitate orders. Um weren't aware of the amount of midazolam that was being used um, in inappropriate amounts uh, for inappropriate treatments. Um, And I think it's been acknowledged now already, um, and a lot of people don't want to admit this, um, but it's been acknowledged that those numbers were artificially inflated. And to what end do you think they were artificially inflated? Okay, so do you agree that the, uh, the numbers were artificially inflated? Uh, no, I, I don't think that I do. Um, I, I think. Uh... Let me just give you this point: If somebody tested positive for COVID and was run over by a bus and killed, that counted as a COVID death. So let me ask you again: Do you think the numbers were overinflated? I, I think in that case that that should not be counted as a COVID death. But I think there were other no, ca- no, other cases, case, for example. So in that case, the numbers were overinflated. Okay, and and if what we saw in terms of the excess death was, you agree well, with that? 
I, I, I'm about to answer that. So if what we saw in terms of the excess death was an awful lot of people dying in road traffic accidents that were being classified, like the majority of them in road traffic accidents, then yes, that would be overinflation. But I think what we saw in a lot of the, the cases, and I think there was even a freedom of information request that was um, to, to ask about how many people died with just COVID on, the birth, on the, the, the death certificate. And what we we're actually seeing is people were dying of pneumonia and of, uh, of respiratory failure as well as COVID. And so on the, on the death certificates, they were getting both those things on there. Some of that was due to the, the stuff that they were being given. And, and uh, so this is interesting then about the care homes. You say people didn't know what was happening in the care homes. What, what, what would you say was happening in the care homes at the time? Um, well, placing do not resuscitate orders on people yeah. uh, and giving them uh, end, of, end of life drugs when they weren't really at that stage in their, in their care. And what makes you think that? What makes you um, sure that they weren't at that stage in their care? Because, because, so, yeah. Cool. So, sorry, I, I, I'm just curious to know uh, when I put my point across about the uh, numbers being inflated. Are, are you suggesting that the numbers weren't inflated? Uh, I think there was a great deal of uncertainty. I think there were certainly some cases where people were listed as a COVID death. If you're saying there were people in traffic accidents, for example, um, I don't dispute that 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 would be uh, would be in there. But I don't necessarily think it was a substantial portion of what we were seeing. I think the majority of the excess deaths were were respiratory failure and, and related. Right. So why do you think there's more deaths this year than what there was during the pandemic two years ago? Um, it, this year, you mean in 2022? Or yeah, 2022 and, and continuing into this year. Yeah, I'm, so I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't got the, the excess death figures in front of me. Um, I would be surprised if that were uh, the case. I'd genuinely be very surprised if that was the case, that we were seeing uh, uh, a continuation of excess deaths. The numbers that I saw most recently seem to suggest that the numbers of excess deaths were, were falling commensurate with uh, the efforts that have been taken to, to mitigate the virus. Right, so... so... You're so that you don't think that the fact that you locked people down, um, that you stopped uh, people having cancer treatments, stopped people having cancer diagnoses, do you think that had an effect on everything? Oh, no, absolutely, yeah. There was, uh, there was a time when people couldn't get care in hospital because the hospitals were overwhelmed. You, good idea. Uh, sorry? Do you think lockdowns were a good idea? Uh, I'm, I'm sort of on the fence, to be honest. Um, I think they could have been handled far better. I think they could have been uh, implemented far better. I think they were certainly over-policed in quite extreme ways. People shouldn't have been given fines for wandering around with a cup of coffee. Um, but I think what... But I think... But you, but you don't disagree with the idea of a lockdown? Uh, no, I, I don't think I do if you were... To, but I think this is, this is kind of the, the fundamental differences. If you don't accept the premise of COVID being a deadly disease, then any mitigations taken are, are unnecessary. Yeah, the government itself told us in March 2020 that this wasn't a high consequence infectious disease. So how does that sit with you? Um, so I think this is interesting because I think there were certainly statements on the government's website where they said that. And there were also statements that the government made that were suggesting that this was a high consequence disease. So I'm interested as to why you believe only one of those sets of statements. Um, because it was because it was documented by the government. But you don't believe what the government says, do you? It was documented by the government that it wasn't a high consequence infectious disease. So why would they tell you that? Well, you, you tell me why, why would they tell you that? I mean, I'm interested in, uh, in what you think. Well, because they knew that it wasn't any more deadly than the flu back in 2020 and that all of the nonsense that they put in place to deal with it was going to have no effect whatsoever. And you can compare that to countries that did lock down and didn't lock down. Um, and I think the evidence is pretty clear and it's stacking up now and coming out more and more each day. Um, that lockdowns made no deal. In fact, lockdowns were, were did far more damage than they did help. What I think is interesting there is, um, so I think what your the your perspective on things is that the government was deliberately um, locking people down to uh, to to well we'll come to we'll come to why in a in a in a later moment, but that the government was deliberately doing this knowing full well that the virus wasn't particularly dangerous and that these things weren't necessary. But it seems interesting then that the government, having put all that stuff in place to control us wouldn't then just change their web page to say, actually, this is really dangerous. So why do you think the government were honest, in your view, about how deadly COVID was, but then dishonest about everything else? 
<clears throat> yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know if I have uh, the answer to that. I think you'd have to ask uh, the people in charge what their intentions were. I don't think you'll ever get the uh, <laughs> the actual honest answer out of them, but I think there is a lot of stuff uh, around all of this um, which doesn't sit comfortably. Mm. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of stuff if you um, – wanted to go into or have, have actually looked into what the Greek, the Great Reset is all about, the, you know, the, the ideas that the World Economic Forum have about changing society, uh, then I think things start to make a, a lot more sense. And, and I, do, I do want to come to some of the Great Reset type ideas a little later in the, in the interview. Um, but sort of covering, covering COVID there, um, I know that you're vocally against the, the, the COVID vaccine. Um, what is it about the COVID vaccine that, uh, that you oppose so strongly? Um, what is it that I oppose so strongly? Um, right. Well, well, the first thing that I, I looking back, the first thing for me was that um, there it was impossible for there to be any long term safety data of this vaccine because it took less than a year to develop it. Sure. So, so it's impossible uh, to. For any scientist, anybody, any pharmaceutical company to say to you, this is safe and effective. It's impossible for them to say that because they are lying. They have well, no idea if it's safe and effective or not because they haven't had the time to do the safety trials on it. So that was two very big lies right from day one. So, so that's interesting, I think. So I think I agree that uh, when the vaccine was released, we couldn't know what the uh, we, we couldn't have 10 year data, 10 year out data about what it does, because obviously that's the nature of a novel. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So like this is brand new. So we well, and I, and I think when the vaccine was released to the public, we could actually have one year data because it had been through uh, trials with some people for for the time since you know 2020 through to its release. We had about a year, but we didn't have the long term data is what you and, and guess what? Guess what? In those trials, guess what? What? They didn't test. They didn't test to see whether you could still uh, contract the virus uh, and pass it on in those no. trials. What kind of what kind of vaccine is that then? Well, this is the thing. So I think this is an interesting point because, um, and again, the, the difference here will be if you were to accept the official version of things, and let's just look at the official version of things for a moment, it is that COVID was very deadly. And, it, and once, you, uh, once you're on that premise, a treatment that will prevent you from uh, being hospitalized and being uh, killed by this uh, deadly disease is kind of the most important thing. A vaccine that you can have ahead of time that will prevent the, uh, the, the hospitalization. Similar to, for example, the measles vaccine. You know, I, I was vaccinated for measles when I was a kid. Um, and when I, when I or, or one of my family members got measles, what they got was an incredibly weak form of measles because the vaccine uh, was preventing it from doing really serious damage. So, it, so a vaccine can actually prevent you from being hospitalized, but maybe not prevent you from getting it. But when what you're trying to do is stop people dying ultimately, and that's, you know, if you accept the premise of what, what, uh, what COVID was doing, then a vaccine can be useful for that, even if it doesn't stop you transmitting it along. So what, what do you make of that kind of idea? I think you're rewriting, I think you're rewriting, I think you're rewriting history. Um, uh, they uh, are you aware that they had to change the definition of the word vaccine before these vaccines to them to be called vaccine? Um, I wasn't aware. What did they change it to and from? Were, were you aware of that? Uh, no, like I say, I, I, I wasn't aware. But well, what, they, what, they what changed, changed the, the wording of it. So they, they changed the wording so that it meant that you, you weren't actually uh, immune from it. So they, they had to change the wording of, of what a vaccine was because actually, technically, uh, it's a gene therapy. Uh, sorry, Matt, I'm, I'm losing you for a moment here. It's um, it's breaking up quite badly. Um, Not a vaccine. What, 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 what? Hi, can you can you hear me there, Matt? Uh, I can hear you perfectly well. Um, uh, I'm not... Sorry, it was just starting to break up a bit there. Sorry about that. Uh, no, that's that's no problem. Um, would you mind just repeating that last bit because we just didn't quite get it? Yeah, so um, the uh, they changed the definition of the of the word vaccine before these vaccines came out. 
to allow it to be called a vaccine because it's actually a gene therapy. Um, and that has been admitted by uh, the head of uh, the pharmaceutical companies themselves. So it's not, I'm not saying anything, anything controversial there. Um, and by gene therapy, are you, are you referring to all of the COVID vaccines or are you talking about the M- mRNA ones? The, M- the mRNA ones, yeah. Okay, so would you therefore have no issue with the Johnson & Johnson one, for example, which is just standard vaccine technology? No. Like it doesn't use mRNA? Uh, no, no, I would I would still have an issue with that because uh, the same thing goes uh, with the long-term safety data. Same thing applies to that. Yeah. My whole premise of it was that, was that we have no idea what this will do to you in a year's time, in five years' time, in 10 years' time. So that was, that was the whole issue why I decided very early on I wasn't going to touch these things. Okay. And so if I can take you back for a moment yeah. to... Uh, just to put it into context, I, I had every other vaccine in my life. Mm. So when people shout anti-vaxxer at me, um, it, it's a little bit disingenuous. Um, they don't know my history. Uh, and basically, they're telling me that I shouldn't think for myself um, and think rationally about things and make my own decision. Uh, because that's really selfish, and uh, uh, and I'm afraid I, I don't subscribe to those ideas. I think mm. everybody should make their own informed choice, um, and they can decide whether they want to take the government's word for it, or they can look into it themselves and make their own decision based on what they've read about it. Um, and that's what I decided to do. And for that, uh, I was castigated as an anti-vaxxer, um, you know, and a, and a COVID conspiracy theorist. Uh, all those nonsense words that people use to try and shut down debate uh, because they don't want to actually talk about things, which yeah. is for me a little bit, it's a little bit childish. I'm like you, I'd rather be able to talk and debate about things uh, and have open conversations mm. because of how we move on as a society. Um, and so that was kind of one of the big things for me um, in everything that happened over the last three years is that there was no debate. It was you just saw the government line on it and everybody else who who deviated from that line was censored and cancelled. And um, that for me was something I didn't I didn't enjoy. I don't think that was the sort of thing that I would expect to happen in China. And it was happening right here in my own country. And I was very perturbed by that. Yeah. Um, oh, there's so many places I'd like to go <laughs> with this. Um, but if I just take you back for a moment, you say that you, um, you're you not an anti-vaxxer. You've been vaccinated for, for lots of uh, other things previously, which, you know, it's it's, it's your medical history. That's not uh, not a, a question. But um, I'm interested in if somebody was to come to you now and ask whether you think they should be vaccinated for, you know, measles, mumps, rubella, polio, would your positions now on COVID have made you rethink those vaccinations uh, otherwise, or are you still, those vaccinations are great, it's this one that's the problem? Um, I would probably, if somebody came to me now and, and asked, should I have should I have these vaccines? I would probably say, um, before you take that vaccine, if, get, get as much information you can about it as, as possible, and then make up your own mind. Mm. So take advice from lots of different people. I take advice from pro uh, people and take advice from people who are warning against it. Weigh up those two arguments and then allow yourself to kind of list, almost listen to your gut feeling and, and take both sides of the argument and then see, right, which one makes more sense to me? Yeah. Which one resonates with me? Um, and then make your decision based on that. That's what I would say. Yeah. So, so I mean, if you were to travel, I, I went to Brazil a couple of years ago. I had to get a yellow fever vaccine before I went. If you were to go and do something like that, do you think you'd take that vaccine or do you think you'd be leaning against it these days? Um, I, I haven't really looked into that that mm. particular vaccine. Um, but I, again, I would probably um, do some research on it. I speak to some uh, some eminent people in, again, both pro and anti um, and get uh, get both sides of uh, of the argument, and then and then see if it's worth it. If if that trip is so important to me, um, you know, do I do I make up my mind based on the the safety data? Um, and if that was the case, then yeah, I take it. Uh, if if it didn't feel quite right to me, then I go. Do you know what? That trip's not that important to me. I'm not going to take it. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, just leave it this time, uh, and and go with the flow. Yeah, well, if it helps, Rio is a lovely place, so I'd highly rec- recommend uh, I, recommend going. <laughs> when I was twenty, age. 
<laughs> um, you mentioned about looking for alternate, lo- looking for both sides of it, and I'm really interested um, then about uh, you know you said you start to do your own reading. Um, where do you get information from? What are your go-to sources when it comes to trying to understand this stuff? If it's not, I assume the mainstream media and mainstream sources. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I've um, because of the stance that I've taken, uh, I happen to have made some. Uh, very good contacts um, with scientists and doctors who um, were warning about uh, this stuff very early on. Um, uh, And I think for me, I I kind of tend to believe more in people who haven't got conflicts of interest when they're talking about a certain subject. Um, So I've become very sceptical of people who are funded by the pharmaceutical industry talking about vaccines and I'm talking about people like Chris Whitty, Robert Van Tam, uh, Patrick Valance, um, people who have clear conflicts of interest um, and, and are giving you advice on things. So uh, I've tended to, to speak to other people who perhaps are not in the, in the pocket of the pharmaceutical industry and who will give their honest appraisal of things, in my opinion, um, uh, and I take it from there. Yeah, so so this interests me in a number of different ways, I think. Um, and I agree, conflict of interests, I think, are, are uh, incredibly important to bear in mind. Um, you know, I have friends who've worked in uh, pharmaceutical kind of research, and they, they work for universities where their funding is coming from a university and not from pharma. And I think those those kind of places are, are, have a lot more independence because it doesn't matter what they what results they come up with, the funding's there regardless, so they can properly test stuff. Um, but what I think is interesting is, I spend a lot of time talking to people who uh, have um, uh, ideas and opinions and uh, and perspectives that are outside of the mainstream. And I think sometimes I find there are kind of undeclared conflicts of interest. You know, this person might not be funded by a pharmaceutical company, but they make their living now from going around and giving talks on this and getting uh, donations from people who are who are who um, have interest in these ideas spreading. And they don't necessarily put that front and center in their work to say, look, I know I'm writing about this, but I also got paid ten thousand pounds by someone to uh, to talk about these. So how do we how do we evaluate when there are undeclared conflicts of interest, I think, is, is the question. Um, well, you, so undeclared um, conflicts of interest are on both sides of the fence. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. And this is why, and this is my point, the last two years, the last three years, we have only heard one side of the story. So we've only heard the one side of the story with people of conflicts of interest on that side of the story. Now, everybody else on the other side has not been allowed to have a voice in the mainstream media. Mm. So where's the fairness in it all? So if I could take you back to a moment for a, to, a, to a hypothetical I, virus. I did ask you a question there, but you just ignored well, it. Well, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm, I'm trying to answer the... I will answer the question, but this is, this is how I would answer that, <laughs> I think. I, I, promise, I, I promise this is just a way of getting to the answer to the question. Um, okay. No if problem. we were to look at a, a hypothetical virus that we, we both... Think, so in a, in a different world, a fantasy world, there's a virus that we both agree is incredibly deadly and is, and is definitely killing people. So in this fantasy world, this made-up virus is doing that. In that world, if there were people who were saying, don't believe the virus is real, don't believe the virus will kill you, um, when we both agree that actually this made-up virus is incredibly deadly in our fantasy world, um, would there not be some reasonable measures that could be taken to stop people from sped- spreading stuff that might put people at harm's way? Is that Would that not be a reasonable thing to do? Because it can, be, it can sound incredibly persuasive to people who don't necessarily know the ins and outs of the science to hear both sides and think, well, this person who's saying, don't worry about it, it's fine. Um, that's quite reassuring, so I'll do what they say, even though we both agreed in this kind of fantasy world that the virus in that question is real. Um, no, I, I, I'm a big believer in, uh, and if the ideas are stupid, I think people will be able to sort out for themselves. Um, and as we said before, if there was this deadly virus, people would uh, see it all around them um, and uh, they would act accordingly. Um, so, no, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not somebody who wants to stop people from uh, spouting off stupid ideas, if that's
uh, country should be policing people's opinions. Uh, sorry, because- Matt, I, I lost you again there. Could you just go back oh. 30 seconds? Sorry, I, there's just something that keeps cutting out slightly. Uh, I do apologise. Um, I'll tell you what, let me try and let me see if I go in a different room. Yeah, so I, so I'm I'm a big believer in in people being able to uh, express their uh, opinions openly. I think if those opinions are stupid, I think they're all people should be able to uh, define for themselves what they are. Um, and I don't believe that we should be policing people's speech uh, mm. because, as I said earlier, I don't want to live in China. Uh, so I think that. People should always be uh, allowed to have their opinions, no matter how stupid we think they are. Um, and uh, I think it's a very dangerous road to go down because the thing for me about all of that is who do you decide, who do we decide is the arbiter of what is stupid or not? Mm. Who makes the ultimate decision? So this is this is the whole point of freedom of speech. You can't, you're not going to appoint somebody as the arbiter of who, what is stupid or not, because if you could appoint one person who's the arbiter, how do you know he's telling the truth? How no, do, I think that's incredibly valuable. Yeah, that. yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right uh, uh, on that. And I think one of the ways that I suggest we go about that is is how we we verify information, how we go about checking things. When people cite a study oh, and say this study works, how do we how oh, do we not, check it? Not the f- not the fact checker, surely. Surely well, you're not going to go down the fact checker route. I, I'm not, not not necessarily the fact checker route, but um, for example, Who fact checks the fact checkers. Well, I mean, we can we can fact check the fact checkers. That's my point, really. Is that if everybody is laying out on the table what it is that they're basing their idea, their their um, their conclusions on, we can go yep. away and check that conclusion. So when someone says, you know, this study proves there are all exactly. these side effects, that's, and that's my point, and that you've just you've just backed up my point is that we should be able to see both sides of the story and make our own minds up. And so when someone bring comes to you and says there are studies that show um, there are these side effects of the vaccine, for example, do you go to read the study? Do you actually go and pull the scientific study and, and have a read of it yourself? Uh, I, I haven't read the scientific studies themselves. I've spoken to people who have been vaccine injured um, and I've had that uh, actually written down in black and white that uh, that their injuries have come from that mm-hmm. so i know that it has side effects so when so when everybody spouts out that this is safe and effective this vaccine um there should be a caveat to that because it's not safe and effective for everyone no no and, and i think most people when you push them out would accept that in the same way that ah, some people yeah. will have a, a side effect par- paracetamol nah. that you don't expect no nah, but that's not true is it that's not true because all you've ever heard on the mainstream media is that these vaccines are safe and effective. There is never, ever any caveat on the mainstream media that says these are safe and effective for most people. Yeah, and, and I think this is this where it gets into a tricky question. Me. Yeah, That's what annoys me about it all, is that I think people, they'd actually, they'd actually get more people on side if they were more honest about it and not sweep the vaccine injured under the carpet and not let anybody, because... We know why they're doing it. They don't want to have vaccine injured stories on the mainstream media because it would undermine the vaccines. It would promote vaccine hesitancy. That's why they're doing it. Now, I believe if it's rare, which is what they're saying it is, mm. why not have those let those people have a voice, compensate those people first yeah. and foremost, compensate them, let them have a voice, let people know that there is a small chance that these vaccines might damage you. There's a small chance that they might kill you. But then but they won't do that. They just roll out, oh, it's safe and effective. It's safe and effective. It's not safe and effective for everyone. So don't freaking lie about it. And so so I think this is interesting. So I do agree with you that uh that we shouldn't pretend that it's impossible for someone to be harmed by these vaccines. But I think what's or by by any medical intervention, in fact, you know, some people, as I say, will take uh an aspirin yeah. and they'll have a a, a allergic reaction and it might really harm them and we put that on the 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 uh bit of paper the label you get with a, an aspirin to say there's a small chance that you might have a, an aller- allergic reaction but and i think that was what, the other thing informed consent about the vaccines yeah but but i think were what's interesting of, were you told of the possible were, were you told of, oh sorry i mean, I, I don't know if you, you don't have to answer this but if you were vaccinated were you told about the 
possible side effects. Was there a, uh, an insert when you went in there that you read and, and it told you what all the side effects of the vaccine were? Uh, yeah, I was, I was told the, the potential side effects of the vaccine before I, before I got it. Um, I, I think... By who? Who told you that? Uh, the, the nurse who was administrating the vaccine. And she told you that it was possible that you could die from this? Yeah, yeah. No, you're, I mean, you're the first person that's ever said that. But I, but I think I think a lot of people, you know, they get handed a bit of paper and they don't necessarily read it. You know, I was handed a, a thing saying here are the possible side effects. But it, I think I think where people um, where this gets a little tricky is it, it, we start to come into like public health messaging. In that, um, let's say for example, there was one in a million or one in ten million people who could get be severely damaged by an intervention. Um, if you were to have that person on the BBC News. Uh, uh, you know, the, the nine o'clock news and everyone in the country or whoever still watches the BBC uh, manages to, to see them, then the average person is going to come away and say, well, I heard about this person who got injured and therefore I might not be willing to take the vaccine. But if if one in a thousand people, for example, from a hypothetical virus were going to die because of it and one in 10 million would die because of the vaccine, the vaccine survivability rate is far higher than the virus survivability rate. But what you can't do is then say, well, we've got one person here who is injured, we'll put them on telly. And then to balance that out, we've got 100,000 people uh, who weren't injured and who were saved from death by this vaccine. So we've got to have a hundred thousand and one people in order to make sure that this is balanced. So we don't give a, a false impression. Right. So you, so you're saying that, um, there should be proportionality on the, on the television. I think if there was proportionality on the television, I think we'd, we'd find it incredibly boring because, um, it's the dog bites man versus man bites dog. You know, when, when a dog bites a man, it's not news. When a man bites a dog, it is. When someone gets stabbed in your neighborhood, that's news. When everybody goes about their daily life and doesn't get stabbed, that's not news. And so we end up fear-mongering people because of the, the, the novelty of the stuff that you don't necessarily see. But that's exactly. just kind of, well, that's the human nature fear of gossip. Fear-mongering is exactly what it is. But I, but I think it's I I think we accidentally fear monger people because it's the human propensity for gossip is that the the unusual I, thing is the stuff we look out for. So that that's where we have a difference of opinion. I I think the the news channels uh, deliberately fear monger. Okay, so this this is interesting to go into a, another area that I wanted to to, to get into. I, I realise we're sort of knocking on through the interview, but it's nice we're covering lots of ground. Um, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> you say that the the news channels are deliberately doing it. You say that the government is deliberately lying. I'm interested into what the the big picture is here. So, what do you think is going on from a big picture? If COVID is just kind of one aspect of it, you know, why are they doing this? Why are the news still involved? News all involved and and joining in on it? Um, what's really happening? Do you think? Uh, I think it's a, a, a huge societal shift is trying to take place. Uh, and again, it, it's part of the, the Great Reset. Uh, I think all the stuff that goes with that, the digital currencies, uh, the 15-minute cities, um, all that stuff that would have been uh, shouted down as conspiracy theories about two years ago, all of a sudden is uh, is starting to make news and people aren't happy about it. Uh, but what do you think is the ultimate goal? If, if these are all of the um, the means that they're using, whoever that they are, and we may come back to who that they are in a moment, um, but if this is the means that they're using, what is the overall goal, do you think? Um, well, it appears to me from, from what's been happening, the overall goal is to um, destroy the middle class. Um, I think uh, the, the stuff that I've been seeing... Um, you know, if you read about all the, the net zero stuff, you know, the, the recommendation that, you know, most of the airports in the UK should be shut by 2030. Um, uh, it would appear that they don't want people to travel. They want you enclosed in your little 15 minute cities. Um, and the, you know, the, the old way of living is only going to be available to the super rich. That's how it that's how it appears to me. But that that still sort of feels like the what is that this is what they're going to make. They're going to destroy the middle class. They're going to keep you in your 15 minute city. I promise we'll come to 15 minute city in a moment too. Um, but what's the the why there? What's the purpose behind it? Like what, what are they? Why are they doing it, do you think? Why are they doing it? Um, I mean that that's that's a, a question that could only be answered by the by the people perpetrating this. Um, we can only guess as to uh, the reasons why they're doing it. Um, a, a hatred for 
humanity, I think for me is probably the the most simplest answer. Uh, are they not humans as well? Well, uh, they are incredibly rich, incredibly powerful people uh, who look down on on the plebs of the world. Mm. Is what uh, is what it appears to me. Ah, see, I can agree with you on that completely, that there are incredibly rich, powerful people who don't care about the average person. But I, for me, it feels like that's kind of, that's enough without me needing to then go into, and therefore they're going to try and lock us into, you know, this particular borough of Oxford without letting us drive through Oxford to the other side of Oxford or Canterbury or the, the place where 15-minute cities have been, you know, but brought, are, brought up. But they are trying to do that, you know that, don't you? Uh, it, it, what, they're trying to do what, sorry? They are trying to do that with the 15-minute city, stop you from driving out of your borough. No, but this is the interesting thing. This thing I found really interesting about the 15-minute cities is that when I looked into it, um, it seemed like they weren't. They were saying, don't go through Oxford city centre with the Oxford protests very recently. Um, take the ring road around the outside because it seemed to me like Oxford was a city that was designed before cars. And I don't know if you've ever driven through Oxford. It's a nightmare. <laughs> I try and avoid it as much as I, I can. I don't, I don't go south very often, but I try and avoid uh, dri driving through Oxford because uh, hey. it's a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and 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 I would uh, I, I would agree with that, and I would agree that anything that um, can alleviate traffic problems um, should be should be looked at. Mm. Um, but uh, I think it's it's a little bit more than that. Um, and you know the the whole premise of of how we've got here in the first place is because uh, these these issues are done very gradually over long periods of time. Very small changes that people don't notice and don't really protest about because it doesn't really affect them. Um, and it's a case of boiling the ethical frog. So they're not going to stop once they do this first bit. You can be sure that the next bit is going to. You know, when they first introduced income tax, you know, they probably said. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll just have this. It's just going to be this, and then they've gone. Oh, oh, yeah, we they've accepted that. I wonder if they'll accept VAT as well. Oh, oh, yeah, they've accepted VAT. I wonder if they'll accept tax on their car as well. Oh, and I tell you what, while we're at it, they've got, we, they've accepted the car tax. What else can we tax them? Oh, I know. Let's tax. <laughs> let's tax their. Uh, um, let's say. Uh, council tax. Let's do that one. Hmm. So yeah, so they've accepted that. Now, now what else will they accept? And they keep taking it, taking it gradually, gradually, taking more and more until you're going to have very little left. Um, uh, and so this is the whole boiling the ethical frog uh, thing. Um, uh, and so that's kind of um, the way that it goes. With that's why I think a lot of people are starting to kick up a fuss because they can see that it's not just going to stop. At, yeah, uh, just diverting the traffic from your city centres. Uh, it's interesting. Again, it's it's I could go in so many so many different places, and I and I I you know I agreed with you when you're talking about the 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 super wealthy don't particularly care about people. But for me, one of the solutions to that is tax. I I you know have become middle class. I grew up in a council estate in the northeast. There's not a lot of money there, and I don't mind paying tax because I recognise that we had nothing and what we had kind of was reliant on the state. The fact that we lived in a council house that we wouldn't have been able to afford if we weren't paying sort of reduced rents, that my sister was disabled, she got a disability allowance so my parents could look after her. These are all things that the, the state can help provide if we pay our taxes. For well, me, the issue on, is we should be taxing the rich more. <laughs> hang on a minute. Hang on. The state aren't providing that. Where do you think the state gets their money from? From taxing. Absolutely. But from I'm, us. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't from mind paying taxes. Man. It's uh, not your state. It's not your government. It's no. your fellow human being that are that are funding your your life. It, yeah, well, growing up, that's that's absolutely true. But what I mean by that is, I therefore don't mind paying taxes now because I don't. My taxes are going towards hospitals and things. Where I where I dispute things is where the super wealthy don't get to pay tax because they can pay for you know very expensive accountants who help write the Tory tax law and uh, and put big holes in it for them. Um, but what what I find really interesting here is that. It seems like we agree that the super wealthy should not have that amount of money. That there's that these ludicrously exp uh, ludicrously wealthy people out there. I don't. I don't. I don't begrudge them having that amount of money. What I begrudge them doing is then trying to change our lives dramatically to stop us from uh, having a relatively successful and and happy and comfortable life. Mm. But it, but I know that um, you were talking about like big corporations. I, I had another interview with you were talk, where you were talking about how one of the ways you can fight back is to 
you know, go to your local greengrocer rather than go to the big corporations so we don't kind of centralise money in the pockets yeah. of, uh, of the super wealthy. And when I heard that, I found it a little hard to kind of square with the worry about 15-minute cities only in the sense that what I've looked into when I've looked into 15-minute cities is the idea that you should be able to walk within 15 minutes to the doctor's surgery that you need to see, to the, the shops where you need to buy your food, to the various amenities that you need in your daily life, rather than having to get in your car and drive for 25 minutes to the big supermarket chain out of town. So it feels like one oh, of the ways that we you, support them. Uh, so, uh, see, I, I, don't, I don't mind that, but what I don't want is I don't want my, I don't want, I want to have the choice. Yeah. I want to have the choice to be able to get in my car or not. Um, because I mean, I'm, I'm kind of getting from, from what you're saying there is that you're a big believer in, uh, in climate change and that, um, CO2 is this deadly gas that's going to kill us all. Um, uh, but I, I, again, um, I, I believe that that is another one of their ways of taxing us, uh, into poverty. Um, you know, uh, taxing, trying to tax us on our carbon emissions, uh, it just seems like it, it feels like they've they've explored every possible reason they can to tax us with, and now they're going to tax the air that we breathe. It's got to that point. Yeah, so I mean, I I I do believe that climate change is real, and, and part of that is because I know people who work in climate research who kind of do the data, who actually, who as you them? say, who fund them, uh, universities. So the universities, you and me, <laughs> you and me, come on, you and come me, it's tax, taxpayer stuff. <laughs> if, if, again, I, I follow, I follow uh, a lot of climatologists who, uh, and there's, and there's thousands of them that have, uh, have said there is no emergency on this planet in terms of the climate. Um, you know, there's a, been a, a, a declaration signed by thousands of, of climatologists. Um, so, and, so, the, so this again, and, this they're is not a... getting heard. No, but this is a really interesting thing. So I know the declaration that you're talking about, and I know that anybody could sign it. It wasn't a, a declaration where you had to show your uh, your credentials, your qualifications, your expertise. So I know people were signing that with, you know, made up names and comedy names and things. Um, whereas I know there was a recent study, I think in, uh, I forget which journal it was published in, which looked at the uh, the published literature of the the majority of climate science and found that the the consensus on climate change is like ninety nine point nine nine percent amongst people who work with the data. So bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I think what I think is really interesting is about that idea of verifying information. Is that the the declaration, which was uh, an open website that people could stick their name on, for you has more weight than literature, which kind of looks at thousands of papers. So I'm I'm wondering why no, not, one rather I, than the other. I'm not I'm not just going on uh, I'm not just going on that. Uh, I'm going on the declarations that all these scientists that you're talking about, uh, all the predictions that they've made. You know that you know in the sixties. You know, oil was going to run out in ten years' time. In the seventies, you know, there's an ice age coming, uh, and and the Maldives should have been underwater about twenty years ago. All these really, you know, really clever scientists making these predictions, and every time they get it completely wrong, and it's fear mongering. It's it's just we go back to the same thing where they just want to keep the populace in fear because a fearful society is easier to control. They can't control a fearless and intelligent society. No, I, I agree that, that society should be fearless uh, and intelligent. But what I think is really interesting on the climate change, uh, when it comes to, to fear-mongering on, on the climate change, is that we know for a fact that um, incredibly wealthy oil companies were deliberately putting out uh, things to kind of uh, muddy the water. So some of the, the the extreme predictions we know that were, were were made by people who were then using them to discredit the movement. We also know that there was a fear, uncertainty and doubt was kind of the oil industry's playbook to try and muddy this water and put out kind of misinformation. And, and that did a lot of stalking of fear mongering. And I, I, um, I find it really interesting that you don't seem to be as keen to uh, look at Especially in the climate change area, um, the the sources that you uh, that you might agree with that could have oil industry lobbying money behind them. When I think you'd be completely against the oil industry throwing their money around to tell us what to think. <laughs> yeah, it, well, uh, I I tend to look at it uh, from a uh, again a logical point of view, uh, and I've been on this planet for fifty four years. You know, the planet's been around for millions and millions of years. Uh, the climate has always changed. The climate has never been stable. We've gone through ice ages. Um, and for them to try to convince everybody that the change that is taking place at the moment is due to a trace element, gas, 
um, is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, um, quite frankly. Uh, and so um, I think history points to the fact that uh, the climate will always change no matter what we do. Um, I know that the temperature gauges um, that they take, you know, the, uh, the, the planetary temperature that they try to that they try to give us um did you know that a lot of those uh places where they take the temperatures from they've just happened to uh quite a lot of them happen to be next door to airports uh i i didn't know that why would um, they do that why well, would they all be right next to the airport to take the temperature gauge when that is not representative of the actual temperature they're doing it right next to uh a place on the planet where it is going to give you uh, an incredibly high reading and not representative of the rest of the country. But but even I can't check if that's true. And obviously, this is the difficult thing in a conversation. I can't just like go in and, and see where that fact comes from. But what I can say is I know that there are, there are temperature gauges in uh, Antarctica and in the Arctic Circle. And I, and I don't think those are like oh. international airport hubs. But like, so there must be something going on there. Hang on. Wasn't, wasn't the Arctic meant to be ice free by now? That was another one, wasn't it? I, I don't think anyone said it, it was going to be ice free. I think what they oh, said they was did. that if temperatures rise by this amount, this is what we can expect to see. Oh, but we so are seeing. The, uh, uh, I think they did. I think they. I think John Kerry. I think it was uh, said that it was going to be uh, ice free by but, 2013. I think it was. But John Kerry's not a climatologist. Oh, but he was allowed. But but his whole film about it all was quite happily um, taken in by the mainstream media as as fact. And, and reported on as, you know, this is what's going to happen um, without, again, without actually telling everyone, by the way, John Kerry is an climatologist. But so, I th and I think this is what the, <laughs> the, the thing, that, uh, I guess one of the things I'll kind of come back to, there's, a, there's one other bit that I'd, I'd like to kind of touch on, but when it comes to fact checking, one of the thing, things that I always try and do, you know, I'm a, I'm a skeptic, I run a magazine called The Skeptic, um, I try to check my own thoughts to see, could this be true? And, and one of the things that I think, um, I always try to, uh, when people ask me, how do we try and be more skeptical? I always say, you know, check the facts. But first of all, the fact that you agree with, the idea that you agree with, that's the one you spend the most time checking. Because all of us, when we hear something we disagree with, we say, that's bollocks, that can't be right. Google, 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 right, I found something that disproves it. <laughs> but uh, we, none of us... Why... And this is why we should all be able to have our own opinions. But but this is the but the downside of that, the flip side of that is that none of us, when we hear something we completely agree with, go, that sounds right. I'm gonna Google it to see if it's wrong or not. So like we are built to kind of accept stuff we already agree with and reject stuff we disagree with and sort of but head you, off in that direction. But do you not think that there is a part of that that is that is your gut instinct telling you that that's right? Yeah, but sometimes our gut instincts are wrong. You know, uh, I've, but, got, I, I've got instincts you, involved in a place when we were going to be attacked by tigers but, or something, you know? I think, yeah, I think uh, I think we've abandoned our gut instincts. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think we can train our gut instincts to be right most of the time. I mean, I, I've, I've talked to lots of people with lots of different views on this show. I've talked to people who think the world is flat. I've talked to people who think the world is hollow and filled with Nazis. I've talked to people who think there are dinosaurs flying around America. Really? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. I haven't heard this one. <laughs> hey, Rodney Cluffy's I'm, on the on what the am list. I missing out on it. <laughs> I've, missed, I've missed the conspiracy theory. <laughs> oh God, I'm going to get you on, on that one now on, as well. Hang on, back a second. <laughs> hang on, the world is is hollow. What, shape hollow. It's hollow. Yeah, and full of Nazis. He, he said the Nazis escaped there during the Second World War. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh God! You're not going to tweet that now. I'm going to now. Now, when you start <laughs> tweeting that you believe that, people are going to think, "Well, he got that from that interview he did." I'm going to have to up my research game. Here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what the reason I bring that up is like every one of those people would say they're following their gut, but I think we'd all say, "Well, actually." I would say their gut was off on those cases. You know, the lady who thinks we can live without food yeah, and I, she can live on daylight, I think was off on those cases. So like I'm our not, gut I'm can lead us astray. I'm not saying your gut instinct isn't uh, isn't wrong sometimes, but I think if you're if you're uh, pretty open um, and uh, I think you can allow yourself uh, to be open and th and let every thought come into your head and then make your decision based on it, uh, I think your gut instinct will be right a hell of a lot more times than you'll be wrong. That's yeah. my that's that's my opinion anyway. And maybe this is where you and I kind of um why we have such kind of different approaches to things or different views on things, I think. Because I think we can try to train our gut to be right, but we but it, it's 
it's a real wrestle to do that. I think the way that we as human beings make decisions, we make decisions, first of all, emotionally. Like, I, I, I feel this, I think this, I want this. And then you backfill on the evidence. And that's why you go looking for the evidence for the stuff that you want to believe and, and trying to debunk the, the stuff that you don't. See, I think that's where perhaps we're a little bit different because I, I tend not to think about things. And I, and I can back this up with evidence from my wife. Um, I don't think emotionally about things. Mm. I, I have a very rational thought. Uh, so my, my thinking is rational and logical uh and very little to do with emotion and, and my wife can back me up on that yeah see, <laughs> she so constantly I, reminds me that i have no emotions no i mean i mean no <laughs> my wife is the same don't get don't get me wrong but what i mean is i think um it's not necessarily like a surface level emotion but i think it's kind of um we accept the, the ideas that fit the shapes that are in our head. We kind of kind of a, a sense of identity, a sense of value. And then when an idea comes along, we kind of compare it to that and go, yeah, that feels right to me. And then, then if, we, if it feels right and someone says, well, why do you believe that? You don't say because it felt right or because it fits a value. You say, oh, th I, f I saw this thing that explained it. So you kind of, the evidence is often used to kind of justify your beliefs to other people. But the reason we come to beliefs is often kind of because they fit a space in our head. And that to me, I think is is worrying it, it can be a concern if that space in our head is the wrong shape and we have to work to try and you know get used to putting making that shape as right as possible if you see what i mean yeah i mean I, the, the things like the, the the climate change stuff see i'm i'm a massive recycler i mm. I, I think recycling is brilliant I, I think it makes sense it's logical uh, and you know resources need to, if they can be recycled brilliant and if that's going to help the planet brilliant and and I am a, I'm a, like in my street. I probably do three times as many uh, lots of recycling as anybody else on my street. But if you're then going to tell me that CO two is bad for the planet um, when it is basically the thing we need to live, um, <laughs> then I I then go hang on a minute. That, that doesn't make sense. That I'm sorry. I, I'm not going to stop flying on a plane. Uh, if you're going to tell me by me flying on a plane is going to is going to make the, uh, the the planet you know, we're going to destroy the planet uh, by flying on a plane because this trace gas, which is tiny uh, percentage of what's gone on, uh, that doesn't make sense to me. So I can I can see some things where we can do things that can help the planet, but I also see other stuff where you go that doesn't make sense. Yeah, and it, it it's it sort of feels to me like you you just described the shape in the head that I was just talking about, but with an example. You know that the recycling fits the shape in your head, and so you don't question it. I, I actually think there's quite a lot of recycling that it actually fits the shape in my head. It makes it it makes logical sense, yeah. and I think that's what we've stopped. We seem to have stopped as a society being able to think logically, and then you're going to start, and then if you're going to go down that road, you can start we can start talking about the school system and the indoctrination of the stuff that you get taught in schools and universities and all that nonsense. Um, and about the dumbing down of society, which uh, I think is um, completely uh, happening to people. Um, mm. And, uh, and I think it's a really bad, a bad place for this, this planet to be in is the, is the stuff that our kids are getting taught in schools, but that's a that's another another conversation <laughs> for another day. I think that would be a whole other <laughs> conversation itself. Um, I guess there's just one last thing that I wanted to try and uh, try and bring up, and, and this might seem like an odd thing to bring up, and and I I, I mean it with the uh, with the, the the maximum amount of respect. But when people um, will will look at the things that you're saying online now, and they look a little bit about kind of your career too, people will start to make some degree of comparison, I guess, with with David Ike in the sense that he was a, a football involved in the sports world, and then when on to kind of other areas um what do you make of those kind of comparisons or how do you feel about that that kind of idea of uh of, of those comparisons um uh, i i find that a little bit uh a little bit odd um that 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 comparison would be made uh, but, but, i don't think anything that i've said um just because i've questioned uh some of the stuff that the government has done um you know, I, I don't think I've, I've ever said that the, you know, the royal family of lizards. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, so I, I do find that uh, that comparison is um, incredibly disingenuous. Uh, and by the way, um, <laughs> uh, like we spoke about before, some things you get right, some things you get wrong. Um, there's a lot of things that David has said. Uh don't get me wrong. There's a lot of things he said that have been have been not quite right, uh, but there's a lot of things that he has said that have actually come to fruition. Um, so, if people are going to dismiss people uh, because they say that 
you know one thing that they said was wrong and refuse to look at all the other stuff that they said was right um then i think that's a, also a very closed-minded way of doing things i think we've got to be open uh, about things uh, and sometimes we have to acknowledge when when people have been right about stuff um but by the same token um then you also have to acknowledge when you've been wrong about stuff and and i've done that on my social media if i've gotten something wrong um then i've i've quite happily uh, apologized about it uh retracted it um and i think that's the way that that we should be able to to move forward in life you know if you if you come across something where you you go hang, well, hang on a minute yeah I've got, i got that one wrong you should be big enough and man enough to go shit sorry i apologize for that i've got that one wrong um i'll try and do better next time yeah i i agree um i guess it leads to the question and probably the last question uh, of the show um what would it take to persuade you you were wrong about this stuff? Is there anything you could possibly see that would make you think, actually, yeah, I've when got the wrong end of the stick on this? When you say this stuff, which, which stuff um, specifically let's, you talking we've, about? We've been through a lot, you're right. Uh, let's <laughs> let's say uh, the, the vaccine and, and the COVID, COVID, COVID and the vaccine. Uh, okay, well, I, I think um, for, uh, for me to have been wrong about the vaccine, so are, are you suggesting... That I'm wrong to not take the vaccine because I because I didn't know what the long term. No, no, not, not that. Um, let, let me try and reframe it. Um, what would it take for you to uh, to change your mind about the uh, the deadliness of COVID and the safety of the vaccine and the usefulness of the vaccine? Okay, so um, very early on, um, I was of the opinion that the uh, that COVID was uh, about the same as the flu. Um, uh, and I think now it's pretty much accepted. In fact, I think even the World Health Organization had to accept last week um, that they compared it to the flu. Uh, so I said that three years ago. So uh, I don't think there's any um, anything there for me to go, oh, I got that one wrong, mm. um, firstly. Uh, the vaccines, uh, the more I see every day, um, I, I'm more and more happy with the fact that I didn't take it. Uh, when I see what's happened to the people around me and the parents of people around me, my friends uh, and their parents um, and all the side effects that I'm seeing, uh, I'm more than happy that I, I chose not to take it and was sensible enough to wait for um, a few years to see what the uh, what the side effects were going to be. Um, so I don't have any problem with that. Um, I, I don't think there's anything really now given what i've seen that could convince me otherwise that i didn't make the right decision there um where else are we going what, what else do we talk about <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, covid vaccines uh what well, yeah co2 um, there's nothing could persuade you that co2 in too many parts per million in the in the in the air would be a bad thing uh now i think if you look back uh over history if uh, i mean what would be uh, is there anything that would convince you that uh, global warming is a nonsense. Um, yeah, I guess there would or that be. It's not caused by CO two, a trace gas. Yeah, I think I'd uh, I'd I'd have to see some pretty solid stuff uh, explaining kind of the changes in temperatures that we've seen, the the um, more extreme weather events that we're seeing in the last couple of years. Bad, bad, but we're not, are we? I've seen I've seen some studies that have said we're not getting so many extreme weather and less and less people die from extreme weather. Uh, those those each, are two different things, year. though, because we're, we're better at coping in extreme weather now than we were 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Air conditioning units are more uh, more uh, common in places that are extremely hot than they used to be. Things like that. Um, we if you look at the is it. Oh, so it, it's a, it, it, in that in that case, um, if we're going to if we're going to go down that road. Uh, do you accept that clean water and, and clean living and sanitation actually help bring down uh, the incidences of disease such as smallpox and polio and that kind of stuff? And that the vaccine was only brought in quite late on when they were already reducing quite vastly? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, hy hygiene was massive. <laughs> hygiene throughout history has uh, been a huge thing. But at the same time, things like polio, before the vaccine came along, people would survive polio, but they'd survive it on an iron lung, um, you know, Ian Dewey, the blockheads, FDR, they were injured by polio. Um, I don't, I've never seen anybody with polio in my life. That's not true of my dad's generation. Ah, uh, oh, excuse me a second. I was just trying to get, uh, 
Oh, there we go. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> just had another person trying to Zoom call me. Then I was like, no, 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 no problem. I know you're in, you know you're very popular. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yes, so um, yeah, on I, I think there are. I mean, I probably on the on the planetary side of things, uh, on the the climate change side of thing, I could be um, persuaded otherwise. Uh, but I've been on this planet for fifty four years, and if I'm honest, I haven't really noticed a change <laughs> in the weather, uh, quite frankly. And given the historical, um, the, the way historically the the weather has changed on the planet and the the various ages that we've gone through. Uh, I'm not sure that humans can control the temperature on this planet. Uh, I'm pretty sure the sun does that. And, um, you know, the fact that Bill Gates wants to, you know, block that out is uh, is a bit of a concern to me. Um, uh, uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm pretty comfortable with that, but I, I could be persuaded otherwise if I started to see, you know, massive dramatic changes. Okay, well, well, we'll leave it at that, and, and you know, maybe in a couple of years' time, we'll get back in touch and see uh, see where we both are on stuff. Uh, Matt, thanks so <laughs> no much for being on Be Reasonable. I've really enjoyed this. It was fascinating, and I'm really really pleased to talk to you. Be Reasonable is a production of the Merseyside Skeptic Society, featuring Michael Marshall. To find out more, visit merseysideskeptics.org.uk forward slash podcasts. Don't forget, you can support the show and the wider work of the Merseyside Skeptic Society by making a small donation at patreon.com forward slash merseyskeptics, by leaving us a review on iTunes, or by sharing the show with your friends. The theme music was by Dan Thomason. Find more of his work at danielthomason.com. <laughs>